Warning, All Things Crime is a true crime production that may contain violent or disturbing material. Viewer or listener discretion is advised. The other thing that happens in these, I think most entertainment is that they tend to present more of like the more extreme behaviors, right? Sure. And less of kind of what's the average. And so it's a whole wide range, right? Well, that's a, definitely a major component. And so people like, you know, Lee Miller, Dr. Lee Miller, and um, even, you know, Robert Hare, these are people who are highly specialized in more of those type of pathologies, right? Those type of level of criminality, right? And thinking. Um, but the rest of us are working more with the average person. <laughs> and that's a huge component of the work that we're doing. And so um, I, you know, I wanted to kind of help contribute to people's understanding about that aspect and some of what I've been learning, uh, things that I didn't realize. You know, one thing is that part of helping people kind of overcome these behaviors is just acknowledging that fact that, you know, there's just a certain combination of circumstances, biology and trauma usually that create the situation where this person ends up committing these offenses, right? it really could happen to a good majority of us if we were in similar circumstances. Welcome, welcome, everybody. So happy to have you for another episode of All Things Crime. Welcome to this uh, episode here. I'm so excited to have our guest on today. My name is Jared. I'm the host of All Things Crime. And our goal here with All Things Crime is to educate people on the entire investigative process. We're really digging deep into everything from when the police secure the crime scene all the way through to the prosecution and defense and uh, all the specialties that happen in between there. So uh, one of my, uh, and I'm also the, the president of MVAC Systems, which is a forensics DNA collection system. And so I, I can talk about that in another episode, but I want to get into the episode right now with our guest today. Her name is Dr. Araceli Lopez, and she is a PhD in forensic psychology. So welcome, Dr. Lopez, and so excited to have you on here and hope our audience really enjoys this because anything in psychology is absolutely, absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. There's so many facets to it. So if you could introduce yourself and kind of talk about what your history is, how you got into uh, forensic psychology. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I love talking about uh, the field. I'm actually, uh, you know, very excited about talking about it and getting, you know, the general audience to be able to learn a little bit more about what it's about. I find that a lot of people um, have some confusion around what, what is forensic psychology, right? Um, so my name is Dr. Araceli Lopez, and I actually have a PsyD. A PsyD is a little bit different from a PhD um, in that it's just more clinically focused versus research focused. Um, we still have to do the same doctoral process, uh, but we have to uh, prioritize and focus more on clinical practice and training. So um, with my specialty in particular and my kind of long-term career goals, I really wanted to focus more on like the applied practice of clinical psychology itself. Um, so my specialty, I, I, my doctor is in clinical psychology with a specialty in forensic psychology. I did also get my master's in forensic psychology, and that's kind of where I had started my career path in the field of forensic psychology as a whole. Originally, I hadn't really considered getting a doctorate. I think, uh, you know, as a first generation college student, I, I really didn't see kind of that long term trajectory for myself. Uh, it was definitely a very intimidating thing for me early on in school. But, you know, I think once you kind of take care of one step, the next one doesn't seem as bad, right? Um, kind of taking right. care of one step at a time. So that's kind of how it went for me when well, I was it's like, uh, I've, I've got some young kids and uh, when I talk to them about when they graduate high school and, you know, they can't even mm -hmm. relate to that. They're like, oh, that's so far away. I'm, I'm sure that's kind of how you were looking at your PhD there. Yes, absolutely. It seems like so far away at first, especially when you're kind of getting started in uh, undergrad at the first stage when you're getting your bachelor's. Um, so I actually, when I started college, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And um, it kind of started with 
me just getting into different courses because I didn't really understand psychology prior to college. Um, I had really not had any exposure to the field and I didn't really feel like, you know, I had great training even in the sciences in general and the social sciences much less. So when I went to college, I just kind of like, I always did have kind of an interest in like criminal investigations, kind of the law, things like that. Um, I was very interested in kind of those true crime shows as well. Um, I did follow those as well, kind of growing up. And um, I actually I really, really wanted to go into the FBI at first. And I wanted to be a, a federal agent, right? Right. But the funny thing is like, because when I graduated from undergrad, I, I wasn't a citizen yet. So I couldn't even apply for um, the FBI. So that's kind of what led me towards grad school. So at first was just that like, well, I couldn't go into the FBI yet. And I didn't really see what I could do with just a bachelor's in psychology. It didn't, I, it did, I couldn't picture it. So um, I thought that, you know, with what I wanted to do, like counseling and therapy, then I thought, you know, I needed to get my master's at least. And that was kind of what I was told. So I went on for my master's. But I had to do my own research. Um, I didn't even know forensic psychology existed, right, as a subfield. Um, and so I had to kind of do my own research and learn about it. But since I had always had that interest in like the FBI, criminal justice, when I kind of learned about it, I was really excited. And so I started looking up the different programs for forensic psychology. And I was in Texas, in East Texas at the time when I was doing my undergrad. And there was only one doctoral program here in the whole state. I didn't see any master's program at the time because I graduated in 2005. I feel like at that time, um, forensic psychology was actually still not that developed in terms of like the, the programs for studying it at the grad school level, right? I think there's a lot more opportunity for people today that are trying to learn forensic psychology, and that's great. Um, so for myself, I actually ended up having to go out of state um, it, it, there, because I wasn't ready for the doctoral program yet, right? So when I looked, um, I applied at five different states and um, I did get into all of the programs, but I ended up going to the Chicago School of Professional Psychology for my master's program. It just seemed like a great opportunity when I actually was able to go to, in person to that campus and it just, I connected with the people there. So I was really excited for that program. And I did actually really enjoy and appreciate um, the forensic training that I had that, that program in Chicago. The forensic psychologists that were in, at the Chicago school were like excellent. You know, they were all in the field practicing. That was kind of the benefit of going to a PsyD program. Um, most PsyD programs are in, in the professional schools where most of the faculty are actually training and practicing in the field full time. And so uh, that was kind of the the training not that to interrupt I but I, mm -hmm. I'll tell you um out of all of the different disciplines really that are in uh different you know universities and things like that I I can't tell you how important to me what you just said that the professors the people that are doing the teaching are also practicing yes. I think it's a real injustice for people mm -hmm. to not be practicing what they teach I, I'll give you an example. When I first started, uh, I went to Brigham Young University in, in Provo, Utah, and I walked in. I thought I wanted to be uh, in international business. I spoke Japanese at the time. And so I walk into this economics class and the economics professor was a fairly young guy. And he started spouting off. He basically spent the entire first period, I don't know, bragging about his resume essentially, and how he got his doctorate by the time he was 23 or something like that. And, and then um, uh, had been doing postgrad work. And then he was where he is now at 29 at a, at a full professor. And I started adding everything up. And I'm like, this guy's never been outside of academia. He's not. And mm -hmm. then he started, then he starts talking about all these different areas where what businesses should do in this economic downturn and what businesses should do, you know, build up inventory and yes. things like that. And I'm like, how does he know that? <laughs> and to me, yes. I was like, you know, this guy is just, all he's done is read this stuff out of a book. And to me, mm -hmm. people that are educated, that are in turn teaching, that have only learned out of a book and have never actually practiced, to me are the worst because it's all theory. And the last thing, the last thing the world needs are more theorists. Everybody's got an opinion. Everybody thinks they know what they're talking about. 
but if they've not never actually been out there, you know, if you've actually, if your your training is from people that are clinically treating people, to me, that's that's the that's the epitome. Those are the type yeah. of people you want to learn from. I'd rather learn from some guy that's never been to college ever, but has 30 years of business experience. I'd rather learn from that guy than some Harvard professor. Yes. And I and I think, you know, I would agree, um, is particularly within forensic psychology. And I know for myself, I do feel like my experience was better it because of that, you know. There's definitely a place for theory and theory is important. I think it gives us the foundation, but we really do need to include the training that comes from people who are in the field actively practicing. And there are uh, professionals, especially psychologists that are in academia and also practicing, but you know, not everyone is, but I, I think forensic psychology in particular, it is important that people be out in the field practicing to some degree, at least. I think the other thing is that with forensic psychology, I think there's some theory, but it's more focused traits and personality, you know, the psychopathy and more kind of the the behavior and less focused on kind of the the ideology what what um causes it right um, i don't think that's solidified yet and that's really where for myself i realize in the long term i would like to contribute to the field is in helping to really more um develop the theory with regard to um what leads to it and then subsequently what can, we can do to actually address the behaviors right if you had to explain to somebody that has absolutely no, like me, has really no idea of what a forensic psychologist actually does. Mm -hmm. and, and, and if you were to, like, say you're actually on the stand and you're explaining it to a jury of people that have all walks of life and maybe they, they really have no idea what a forensic psychologist does, how would you break it down to them? Well, um, I think the two main main uh, areas of practice for forensic psychologists is, on the one hand, is assessment. Forensic psychology um, is one of those subfields where assessment is a major focus. Um, for assessments play a major role in the court system and in the practice of forensic psychologists. Um, and that was assessment actually one of, of the, of, the uh, person? So psychological assessment of people, yes, who are okay. involved with the criminal justice system. So psychological assessment is just, you know, we do a, a series of psychological tests and cognitive testing, and um, we can also do run personality tests. They're like comprehensive personality tests, not the type that you find on the internet, right? And so with these assessments, it helps us inform, inform us our understanding of the person, kind of what led to their current behaviors, kind of the psychology of the behavior in order for us to then be able to provide recommendations for treatment and rehabilitation. And there's another particular area of assessment, which is called risk assessments. And so that's another important area within uh, the criminal justice system is that uh, forensic psychologists can also do a risk assessment as part of a larger assessment, usually. Uh, we can assess the risk of somebody perpetrating the behavior again in the future, right? Um, so it, it's, it's a comprehensive assessment, usually. And so with these different types of testing that we can run, um, plus we usually conduct also a one-on-one -on -one interview uh, to kind of inform us and in where we can get a more personal uh, understanding and an opportunity to really ask some questions that will be more clinically focused to get a better understanding of the person's psychology, right? Their behavior, their thinking, their kind of reasoning and judgment, right? And all of those things help us to kind of inform and educate the court system and probation system, all of these systems that are then going to take the information, the summary that we come up with and identify the areas of treatment, rehabilitation. And then it's also going to inform their decisions as far as where to place someone. Mm -hmm. So um, depending on someone's level of risk or someone's uh, treatment needs, they might need to be placed in a higher level you know, secure institution, or they might be able to go straight into the community on probation. I have noticed that, especially in more recent years, that I do feel that the expert testimony of forensic psychologists does have a, a major influence. And I think it's a big thing. It's a huge responsibility for us. Sure. Well, you're helping decide the, the future mm -hmm. of a person. And Absolutely. When you say, when you say determine risk, what, what exactly do you mean by that? So we can't say for sure someone is going to commit a behavior in the future, right? That would be predicting. We can't really predict someone's behavior in the future. 
but kind of statistically based on statistics and research, there are assessments that can help us determine if there's a, a low risk, a medium risk or a high risk of reoffending or of committing certain types of behavior. Like there's violence risk assessments, there's assessments for like sexual re sexual reoffending. So those there's certain types of crimes where the court might want to know what level of risk is this person at. And so one of the things that I learned actually when I was able to work with um, the sex offending population um, was that a high risk for reoffending doesn't necessarily have to do with the severity of a crime. So a higher, more severe crime isn't necessarily a higher risk because actually those crimes might not be a higher risk of recommitting the offense, right? Because they, they're going to have like the chances of getting caught again, you know, the, the punishment for it is higher. Um, there's all these different reasons why somebody might not necessarily reoffend a case like, like a murder or um, sexual assault. But for kind of a sexual assaults, I mean, sexual offenses like voyeurism that have to do with voyeurism, exhibitionism, those actually tend to have higher reoffending rates. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, that it just getting me thinking here. I'm just that's so interesting. So especially in in the the sexual assault realm and and those kind of sexual cases. Yeah, I'm just trying to kind of think through this at the same time. And I, I apologize. I'm kind of no, no problem. going along here. But when you say the the risk for reoffending is higher based on the lower level crime, such as, like you said, voyeurism or exhibitionism, as opposed to like an actual rape. Is that just because they the the risk for being jailed is lower the risk for that, taking their freedom is, is over yeah it's that is yes. so interesting so the consequence is the risk of being caught to begin with you know so somebody will commit several offenses before getting caught when it comes to those those um, lower level sexual offenses um that's one of the things i learned you know and i hadn't really considered but you know if you kind of think about it from a behavioral like perspective it makes sense because usually especially with sexual offenses people use a lot of rationalizing right and so if you're committing an offense that, you know, you might feel like it's not really that bad, right? Or your mind can twist it in that way. I'm People not will really tend hurting to somebody more. and so yes. it's not a big deal. I'm not actually hurting someone. Same thing with like child pornography offenses. Those are the same type of reasoning that they use. So mm. they tend, they might be more likely to reoffend. <clears throat> Whereas the other type of offenses tend to be a little more complicated and more like case by case basis. And I think more individualized in terms of the level of reoffending. And it's going to be a combination of like their impulse control, right? So we do testing on impulse control and higher executive functions. Like those things can help us with understanding someone's um, ability to control their behavior in the future, right? And so that would inform our risk assessment. That would be one aspect. The other aspect would be their actual thinking in and of itself. How much distorted thinking do they have? How often do they rationalize and minimize? Do they take um, responsibility for their, be their behavior? Someone who takes responsibility for their behavior right away and shows remorse and things like that is less likely to reoffend versus someone who um, really does not have empathy or doesn't show remorse or things like that. That's why things like psychopathy traits might put someone at higher risk of reoffending in the future. And they're much more uh, serious issues. Sure. Is there a category really, if you think about it, that... Uh, that people really don't take personal responsibility for it, and you would put them in one category. And do they they have the tendency to do certain types of offenses, or is is it just kind of across the board? I will say that one thing that happens with sexual offenses, there tends to be a lot more of kind of that avoidance of admitting the defensiveness. And my impression has been that it's largely related to the level of stigma associated with these offenses, right? So there's so much judgment and stigma that people will rationalize and minimize the severity of their crimes or even outright deny that they committed these offenses until they're able to confront these behaviors without like viewing themselves as these monsters or um, viewing themselves in the terms that society already imposes on, on these people who have committed these offenses, right? I've heard some some of the people call, you know, say like things like that, like, you know, I'm a monster or using kind of that terminology. Um, and so 
when we have these really harsh judgments on our own behavior, it kind of prevents us from really confronting it and kind of being able to work through it and overcome those behaviors. That's so once, the one thing I've noticed. Yeah. So once somebody actually hits the, and, and this has to be legit, of course, you know, they're, they're not just saying, well, mm-hmm. you know, what I did was really bad, but they go take it to the next step and they're actually saying, I'm really bad. And yes. I'm a, I'm a monster. So once, yeah. once they reach that point, do they have, do they have much ability to not reoffend? What level of um, care really do they need or, or incarceration mm-hmm. or whatever, you know, once they've committed a, a, a pretty heinous crime that has a pretty serious consequence mm-hmm. and they also have that psychology that I'm a monster, where would you recommend that? Well, I think when you have that psychology of, you know, I'm a monster, that is a problem because then you're not separating yourself from your behavior, right? Your behavior can be changed, right? And if you innately believe that you're evil, you're a monster, then you're not going to perceive yourself as being able to control your behavior. And so, yes, that is a problem. So the goal in treatment is to get people past that thinking and to get them to a place where like, my behavior was wrong. They can acknowledge that their behavior was wrong and they, then they can confront their behavior honestly. And what happens is that they might be less likely to acknowledge when they're having, um, they're having these urges to reoffend again, right? And so a huge component of prevention is treated in much the same way that addiction treatment is, is done in preventing relapse, right? That's what we, we talk about in uh, sex offending uh, behavior. It's about preventing a relapse of the sexual offending behavior, right? And so in order for them to prevent that relapse, they need to be able to identify when they're starting to have urges to reoffend, to recommit, when they might be at higher risk again. And so if all they're trying to do is deny, 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 um, then they're not going to be able to identify it before it happens, right? And so they're going to be more likely to reoffend. Yeah. Interesting. So you typically get involved in post crime and like post conviction. Once the person is actually in the system, yes. they've been incarcerated, mm-hmm. and you're trying to help them rehabilitate, trying to mm-hmm. determine really how severe the sentencing should be, those kind of things. Now there are forensic uh, psychology type of of experiences or, or people that have that that uh, expertise that is actually in crime prevention, right? So I think particularly that was more early on uh, where there was like the FBI behavioral sciences unit that came up and all that. But I think what they realized is that a lot of that more criminal profiling, it didn't need to be um, psychologists who, who did the criminal profiling, right? On top of that, I think it was also kind of that, you know, the, the scientists and the professionals that um, kind of have a hard time relating to the general population, I think at times, I think at least that's kind of what I've read as far as, <laughs> you know, psychologists didn't really blend in with the, with the FBI that well, right? Or things like that. But if, I think more than anything, um, one thing that happens is that you also see it kind of in, in terms of like science communication in the media. So scientists tend to have a, a hard time communicating in a way that's relatable to the average person, right? And so I think that's, that's was the other obstacle. And I think that that's one of the obstacles we have right now in science and, and professions where the average person cannot relate to our communication half of the time. You know, we get so caught up in our terminology, all these clinical terms, we forget that the average person doesn't speak in this way. So we need to really learn how to communicate and relate the information that we know in a way that um, is much more relatable and much more understandable to the average person. And that's actually a a big component of training in forensic psychology because we do so much communication with other people in other fields, right? That I know a big part of my training was in learning how to one, condense the information that I'm presenting and two, present it in a way that the average person can understand it, right? We have to communicate with juries, we have to communicate with lawyers, the judge, like. A, people don't have time to listen to long rambling, clinical and tedious information, uh, but B, they're not going to understand half of our words and we're not using uh, really relatable terms, right? Um, so I think that was kind of the op- other issue. The other thing that um, someone had recently asked a question in Clubhouse, which was great. They had asked me about kind of the history of forensic psychology. And well, 
one of the things is that forensic psychology early on wasn't really called forensic psychology. It was just psychology practicing in the context of criminal justice, right? And so I, I kind of went back and refreshed a little bit about like the history because, you know, I was never taught the history of forensic psychology. I was taught the history of psychology as a whole. And so I hadn't really like separated the two. You know, one thing that I realized is that early on, psychologists were brought in more on the testimony, the witness testimony, testimony aspect. They were brought in on, on the early research with regard to eyewitness testimony and the faultiness of eyewitness testimony, which was very important in the court system, right? In, the, in terms of the development of uh, practices within the criminal justice system, both by law enforcement and within the courts, right? So I think that that's kind of this epiphany that I realized that, they, that the early forensic psychology was in terms of that area, but that isn't really the major focus now. It's more kind of in what we were talking about, more of the assessment and treatment aspect. That's still, there's still researchers engaged in that, but I think that was more like the research aspect of forensic psychology. And now we're getting more into like the clinical applied practice of forensic psychology, which is more of the assessment and treatment. The other thing that uh, was great, it came up in Clubhouse as well, was that we've been focusing more on just one aspect of forensic psychology, but there are other kind of sub areas of forensic psychology. And another major practice, a major focus for some forensic psychologists is working more with the uh, first responders. So with the law enforcement, police departments, uh, doing assessment and treatment in, in, in terms of the people who are working within the, the, the legal system or fitness for duty evaluations and pre-employment screenings, for example, are major components of assessment that those forensic psychologists do. The other areas of forensic psychology, if, if you just think about the courts, like there's civil court and family court. So there's forensic psychologists that work more in those courts, right, within those court systems. So whether we're talking about workers' compensation cases or family law cases, right, involvement with CPS, parents who are involved with CPS, and they're at risk of losing their children. I've, I've had some experience with parental fitness evaluations. They're not, they're not an area that I want to focus in, just in terms of kind of where my passion is. I, I really enjoy doing the assessment and treatment of, like, criminal behavior itself, right? And people who are involved in the criminal justice system. Um, parental fitness evaluations are actually really, really tough, you know, because you have, that's another huge area where there's a huge responsibility there. You know, somebody is facing potentially losing their child. Forensic oh, yeah. psychologists. We're, we're, <laughs> we're, we've actually adopted three little boys out of the foster care system. Yes. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, I can absolutely relate with what you're talking about there because the birth mom, yeah, I mean, the mm -hmm. birth dad was in and out of jail. And so he was kind of gone. He's kind of out of the picture. But the birth mom, you know, they gave her lots and lots of opportunities to get her act in order, get a job, uh, you know, go to yes. uh, alcohol, you know, therapy and try to overcome that addiction, all sorts of, they gave her lots and lots of chances. And I don't know, it, it, I can't imagine actually making that call of saying, you know what, she is unfit. To, to be the mom of these little boys and for the welfare of the boys, we're going to put them into the, into the adoption stream. And, and mm -hmm. so, yeah, I, I, having watched that firsthand, uh, I, I can, I can really relate why maybe somebody doesn't want to go into that kind of a, uh, mm -hmm. go into that kind of a, that, yeah, that would be really heart wrenching. And, and I, mm -hmm. I don't know, somebody has got to do it. And, and I applaud the people that do, but absolutely. Yeah, well, I can, and that's I can kind of the thing. Why you wouldn't want to do that? <laughs> yeah, and more than anything, I feel like it's it's an area that you really need to specialize in. It's not something that I would want to do half-heartedly, right? Um, but because that's not where my focus and and my majority of training is in, that's not something that you know I feel like you know I need to be seeking because I think somebody who is much more specialized in that area needs to be doing those type of assessments, right? Now, in terms of training, I've definitely gotten training and I am definitely open to getting more training in that area just to be able to have that skill in case I do need to be there and be available to provide that service, right? Because in some situations, that's kind of the other thing with forensic psychology, because sometimes we're in situations where, you know, we just have to provide the service based on whatever the need is, right? So it might not necessarily be in our primary or specialty, but we might be the psychologist in that, in that setting 
who has to provide whatever services are needed, um, such as when you're working for like county or government. And back at that time when I was doing some forensic I mean, some parental fitness evaluation. It was when I was with the uh, Santa Barbara County uh, doing my full-time internship. And so it was a variety of assessments that I had to do. So where does this, where does this separation start happening within the psychology field? Is it like back when you were getting your bachelor's degree, when they start saying, well, you know, you just start thinking about different courses and different uh, disciplines and start moving into different directions? Or is it more into the master's and, and um, doctorate level? I think it's good to start when you're getting your bachelor's, um, but that's, it is much more self-guided, right? Unless you're, uh, there are some undergraduate programs that have, a, um, like if they already have a, a, a graduate program within that department that has more of a specialty, they might have more opportunities to, um, part. the undergraduate training is more of a, general psycho I mean general psychology training um, and you don't really get a chance to specialize until the graduate level again you know what is available in terms of specialty is going to depend on each undergraduate department depending on what the the professors within those departments focus on and then for myself I actually I actually did start taking some courses to kind of um, specialize a little bit uh, so funny thing is I, I was actually considering also animal psychology <laughs> when I was an undergrad so I was kind of thinking about both so Animal I was like, psychology. You know, <laughs> yes. What would, what would that consist of? Well, that's kind of what I wanted to figure out, right? So I did take an animal psychology class because we had a professor there that had more of an animal psychology focus. And so I took an animal psychology course. At the same time, I took a class uh, that was called psychology of aggression. And I took a criminal justice class to kind of get a better feel for these. Um, and uh, the animal psychology class, really when it comes down to animal psychology, animal psychology as a field is more of a behavioral uh, focus and your, you know, the opportunity for doing work is probably going to be more in areas of research or unless you're able to get work in, in zoos or other areas where kind of that behavioral training with psychological behavioral training would be, would be helpful, right? Um, I'm not actually familiar with how many job opportunities there are in that field. And that was only part of my decision. But I had always kind of had this interest in criminal justice in general. So um, I was very excited once I started taking that criminal justice class and the, and the psychology of aggression class. I, I really was very excited for forensic psychology. Well, we, we have a good friend that is involved with some cold case societies. And his name is Dr. Lee Miller, if you're familiar mm -hmm. with him. He, he really specializes in the um, kind of the abnormal sexual and, and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, almost serial killer, serial rapist types. And the yeah, he's sexual violent predators. Yeah. He's really deep into that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and to the level that there's probably only a handful of people in the entire yes. world that have his level of, uh, expertise yes. in that. And he, he was on a, an earlier episode of all things crime and, um, oh, wow. I bet that was great. Yeah, you'll, you'll definitely have to listen to that and, and mm -hmm. even link up with him, you know, on, on LinkedIn and, and other areas. But yeah, absolutely fascinating. You know, once, once you get into the mental aspects of crime, to me, it's, it's one of those things that most people in society just can't actually put themselves <laughs> in the brain of yes. the person committing the crime. And I think, mm -hmm. I think that's one of the things that makes it, especially like the true crime genre, you know, the TV shows, the podcasts, all those kind of things. I think that's what makes them, even the, uh, you know, shows like CSI that are, that are totally fiction. It's still mesmerizing because mm -hmm. those of us that are just, I don't know, I can, I'm not sure I'd consider myself normal by any means, but you know, we, we're, we're not in the criminal justice program system yet. And I, yet, you know, we, it's, it's just so hard to figure out how could somebody do that to another human being? Yes, absolutely. And so once you get into your level where you're talking, yeah, how do I actually figure out what this person was thinking? And is, is this person's thought process to the point that he or she would do it again? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mesmerizing stuff. Yes, absolutely. I would agree. I think that that's kind of one of the reasons why these genres are so popular, right? 
the thing I realized, which is why I wanted to kind of get more engaged in media and, and um, educational content was that I realized that these are very popular, genres, but the far majority of information isn't being presented by people who actually work in the field, right? So I really wanted to help contribute to that and hopefully, you know, help get more of that perspective of, you know, the behind the scenes perspective, the, the, you know, working from the inside perspective so that, you know, the average person can really get a better understanding of what that's like. Because the other thing that happens in these, I think most entertainment is that they tend to present more of like the more extreme behaviors, right? Sure. And less of kind of what's the average. And so it's a whole wide range, right? Well, that's a, definitely a major component. And so people like, you know, Lee Miller, Dr. Lee Miller, and um, even, you know, Robert Hare, these are people who are highly specialized in more of those type of pathologies, right? Those type of level of criminality, right? And thinking. Um, but the rest of us are working more with the average person. <laughs> and that's a huge component of the work that we're doing. And so, um, I, you know, I wanted to kind of help contribute to people's understanding about that aspect in some of what I've been learning, uh, things that I didn't realize. And the biggest thing that I have realized, start to get kind of more an average person in the criminal justice system, you realize that they're actually a lot more like the rest of us. And so I, I realized that, you know, one thing is that part of helping people kind of overcome these behaviors is just acknowledging that fact that, you know, there's just a certain combination of circumstances, biology, and trauma usually that create the situation where this person ends up committing these offenses, right? It really could happen to a good majority of us if we were in similar circumstances, right? And so um, that's kind of one I want to help educate in that area because I think if we can reduce some of that stigma, we can help more people rehabilitate and reintegrate back into society because the reality is that most people are going to have to come back to society, right? And so right now, um, all the stigma and, and the obstacles that people face in reintegrating, it just makes it really hard for them to stop reoffending, right? right. And um, staying involved in the criminal justice system. So the people that you have worked with in the past that have offended somewhere, they've served time and they've either in the process of getting out or are out, what percent of, and I don't know if you actually have any kind of data to support this, but in, in your mind, what, what percent of the people that, that are in that category, they're trying to reintegrate into society, actually have the mentality that they can do it versus oh. <laughs> society is totally against them. They're, they've ruined their entire lives. You know, they're, they're basically screwed. So they may as well reoffend and go back in kind mm -hmm. of thing. I think definitely a good majority that feeling that society is against them, right? The world is against me at this point, or, um, you know, I don't really have a chance at getting back to this. Not, and not just that, but because more often than not, someone doesn't have the experience of engaging in the behaviors that are more, you know, what socially appropriate and acceptable for society. They don't even know where to start really. Right. So some people don't even see themselves capable of doing this. Right. Is that because of their upbringing? Is that because of their level of education? What, what, what do you think stems that? I think it's a combination of things. So what we have is that people within the criminal justice system tend to have higher rates of learning disor disorders, neurological conditions, um, lower academic success, and um, higher degree of trauma, and more of that chronic, repetitive type of trauma, right? Uh, might be either whether it's home-based within the home environment or within the community level. That's what the majority of people in the criminal justice system have experienced, right? And so it's kind of a combination of things. There are more people with, you know, impulse control disorders, right? Uh, like ADHD or um, the other issue is that trauma itself uh, impacts the development of our frontal lobes, which is where our impulse control, our judgment, our planning, our organizing is located. And so because when you experience a lot of trauma over time, what happens is that people end up more, more um, kind of primal brain focused, right? So more of the impulsive and highly emotional, highly reactive behavior is what you're going to see among people with severe trauma. Almost like um, opportunistic. Yes, there's going to be opportunistic type of offending. Um, yeah, usually actually that's going to be more the common type of offending. It's going to be like opportunistic. 
Now, when you get into that more sophisticated kind of type of criminal thinking, that's when you're getting more into the, the predatory, the psychopathy traits. That's that more severe type of criminality that is typically more uh, talked about in the media, right? I think especially like Hollywood almost glamorizes that level. Yeah. They're saying, yeah. you know, most of the sexual predators, for example, or the, or the, the sexual offenders out there are actually the predators that are lurking in your neighborhoods. And, you know, they, they cause that, that level of mystique, mm-hmm. and I, you know, mm-hmm. it's all because that sells movies and, and it also sells headlines and things like that. And so it just, absolutely. but at the same time, I think that also does almost like psychological damage to mm-hmm. society as a whole, because mm-hmm. I think there's, there's a fair number of people and I, I definitely not the majority, but there's enough people out there that literally think that what they see on the TV is like news as opposed to mm-hmm. fiction. And, mm-hmm. and they, they have they have trouble separating them. And, and to me, it's like, yeah, you know, these are great entertainment. But at the same time, we've got to say, yeah, it's just entertainment. And mm-hmm. it's not, you know, this, this isn't real kind of, thing. I don't know. I, it's, it's a weird thing nowadays, you know, everything from video games all the way to the TV everything is almost so it's almost surreal. It's so lifelike. And I I think a fair number of people have trouble uh, separating whether or not it's real or not. Absolutely. Well, and then, you know, to their defense, it's, it's often being presented in that way, right? It's not being clarified, but you know, as long as people haven't been educated or otherwise, you know, they're not really going to know. And so that's kind of what I'm hoping to help (laughs) contribute to the field is kind of help more of the average person understand these things a little bit better. Um, oh, absolutely. No, I, I think there's a massive, massive need for folks just like you. And, it, and it's, that's one of the reasons that I was so excited to have you on is because this is an area that I'm, I'm fairly naive in. And yet, psychological behaviors, I mean, you look all the way back, I mean, there's a whole series now called Clarice, talking about, you know, the FBI agent that, you know, got Dr. Uh, what was the dude's name? I want to say Hannibal. Oh yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. And they, those are those are just like the the psychological nightmares that we all go through. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. But at the same time, it's fascinating and it's mesmerizing. It is. That's, that's it why is. It stands so much. So yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I get very intrigued when I get a case like that. That's certainly a part of it, right? But the thing is, it's when you're actually like sitting with someone like that and interviewing them and having to like read everything in detail like it's a very different experience right um you really get more of the reality of it and it's it's very heavy information that we end up having to go through um and so is there something you can share with us i mean it it, without obviously breaking Mm -hmm. any kind of ethics or anything but absolutely is there a particular patient that jumps out at you that you're just like if, if I'm going to give a lecture at a college about what I really do, this is like the extreme example of it. Yes. Um, well, I actually don't have a lot of experience with that more severe pathology because that's just not that common, right? It is much less common, especially because, you know, those more severe cases, you have to really have more, first, you have to be fully licensed and, you know, have more of that training to be able to, to even be at the level of, assessing and and working with someone at that level because that's you know just basic to be responsible we're going to give those to the people with the most the greatest specialty and training in those areas right so they're not going to give somebody like that to a Who's uh, still training a, yeah somebody in the fbi academy <laughs> yes i mean not somebody who's just going through their training right but i i have had some experience with kind of that degree of pathology just not as freaking as people might think but surprisingly i actually have with the thing is that with the adults, I've worked more in outpatient with the adults where they're already back in the community. Whereas with adolescents are the ones I've worked with in the correctional setting. So more of my severe cases are with adolescents when I was actually within the institutions, because that's where you're going to see the, the more severe cases. I haven't had the opportunity what I would like to. That's kind of where I'm at right now is applying for postdocs. And so I would like to be in a forensic either forensic hospital setting or where I could have the opportunity to do more of that severe, uh, those, those more serious cases, right? Where there's more severe mental health conditions, 
where I would get more experience in that area. That's kind of where I'm looking at. I will say that I had one case in particular that really was like, really threw me for a loop because what happened was that this particular case, it was, it was a, a adolescent. So, I mean, I won't go into too much detail, but the main thing is that I had to do a, an assessment for this adolescent and it was, you know, he was in the courts. So I knew that the, the responsibility with this assessment was great. You know, we have to constantly be thinking about the community risk, safety for the community, safety for people involved. And then we have to be thinking at the same time, I was thinking about like, this youth has his own life ahead of him, right? So my decision is going to impact his life. And so kind of just having to weigh those two out. Uh, but one of the issues that I ran into is that as I was assessing this youth, they did seem to present with that more severe kind of psychopathic type of thinking and pathology. And one of the things that people don't realize is the more concerning type of pathology is when someone actually presents very charismatic. So the people that, that are more aggressive, more um, overt in their behaviors, those aren't the more severe pathologies. The more severe pathologies are the people that kind of present well to others, to the average person. So the average person won't pick up on that kind of pathology. You really have to sit down and really dissect the person's thinking and behavior. And you really have to have the training to understand that psychopathic pathology, right? And so I did do assessments. I did uh, conduct the adolescent version of the hair psychopathy uh, checklist. There's a youth version uh, under supervision of my supervisor at the time. So I had to talk about in my assessment, talk about the concerns for the future risk of this person, even though they actually had not committed a serious, uh, perpetrated a serious offense yet. Um, but they had presented a serious enough. It was, it was an attempted offense, right? An attempted sexual assault offense. But because the person hadn't actually perpetrated, the consequences for them just couldn't be that severe by comparison. And so I had to really, really do my best in educating the courts in terms of that thinking, the pathology, as well as kind of connecting the dots from the early child behaviors to, to that present moment where things were kind of looking very concerning. And so one of the things that you would see is that very early on, people who have that more psychopathy traits will present con really concerning behaviors early on as children, even as young as three years old. Wow. You know, there might be some, some injury to animals. Uh, so there'll be instances and moments that will like, your instincts should kind of like raise some red flags for the people closest in their lives. Unfortunately, what happens is that, you know, the psychology of the person can, can be very manipulative and very charismatic. So the person closest to them don't necessarily realize what's happening. As you were talking, you know, the person that popped into my head was, uh, what is his name? Is it Joran Vandersloot? The guy in Aruba that they think um, killed that, that Alabama girl, you know, 10 years ago. Oh, no, I haven't heard of that one, actually. Oh, geez. You know, the thing just, I... just when you're trying to remember names, they always, they always escape you, right? Why, mm -hmm. why is that? Yeah. Geez, it's right on the tip of my tongue. And I'll, I'll think about it right about as we end. But the bottom line is everything that he talks about or, or when they talk about him, he, that's what he seems like to me is this just physically he's a good looking kid and comes from a privileged background and really um, maybe never had much discipline in his life. Seemed that he was kind of a predator when he would go to bars and things, especially with people that were vacationing in Aruba. And Natalie Holloway, that's the that's the victim's name. Natalie Holloway. Mm -hmm. I can't believe I couldn't remember that. But anyway, he ended up down in Peru or something, and he's in prison now because he killed another another girl down there and kind of the same same MO. But as you were talking about some of these, some of these traits, some of these uh, act, activities, things that they would do being really manipulative, even when they're three years old, that's, uh, that's, that's just so interesting. So any other last minute things, you know, when you're, uh, well, for example, let's, let's end with this. If you were to give somebody advice on going into your field, maybe, a, maybe a real quick reason why, and what you would recommend for a career path. For myself, I'm, I'm eager to see more young minds coming into the field. And I think right now is a great time because here's where I would say why right now is one of the best times for people to come into the field is that I do think that the criminal justice system right now is 
um, more open and more amenable to kind of these changes towards rehabilitation and treatment. And so I think coming in right now, we have the opportunity to kind of really have a greater impact on setting those standards for treatment and really um, helping to have a great impact, which, you know, later on, ideally our work that we're doing today will really help to make some changes for all of society later on. And so I think right now is such a great and exciting time. Um, there's in America, particularly, we still have a lot of major obstacles, particularly at, at the political level. The other thing that I would say is that coming into forensic psychology, I think that you have to be open and ready to do some degree of advocacy and education as well. Because in the area of forensic psychology, our work really impacts society. And our role is, is, is often advocate, advocacy and education as well, whether we're educating the courts, other professionals within the criminal justice system, we might need to be educating politicians who are making the laws and policies that impact our work. And I feel that some of us need to be getting into the political field itself as well. So if some of us with the education and training can actually start to get into politics and actually have a role and influence in the laws and policies, that would be great as well, right? <laughs> I think that would help. Every lawmaker has lots of advisors. So yes, yeah. absolutely. So how, how would somebody get into your field? I mean, just start taking psychology classes? So you would just start with psychology. You can actually even do social work or sociology or criminal justice at the undergrad level, right? Um, you don't have to specialize in the forensic psychology until the graduate level. A lot of people think that you have to get your master's first, but you don't actually have to get your master's first. You can go straight into a doctoral program. But that's going to really depend on how ready someone is and how competitive they are in order to get into a doctoral program. With PhD programs that are at public universities that tend to be more competitive because there's much fewer spots available. Then you have more of like the, there's a lot more kind of private uh, universities nowadays that are more like the professional schools that, that have faculty who are practicing in the field. Those institutions tend to be more just graduate programs. So they have a lot more spaces available for students. And so I think for some students, they might be the better option. However, then there's also the financial issues, right? So public universities are going to be much more uh, available and, and less costly for the average person, right? So it's just kind of having to weigh all of that because at the graduate level, there just aren't as many opportunities for scholarships and grants and things like that. Well, just fascinating, fascinating stuff. And, and I really appreciate you coming on and sharing some perspective with us. It's, it's one of those things where... I hope everybody can follow you on Clubhouse. That's, yes. uh, that's where we first met. And just listening to you go back and forth with some of the other psychologists that were on there, you guys, you guys were getting into some pretty deep stuff, you know, even there on Clubhouse. So yes. uh, it's just such an interesting platform now. To, it is. Uh, to, it really is. It's yeah. so great. Who would have ever thought that something like that would come along? Yeah, I think it's really going to make its mark. So just to be able to go into a room. And to me, it's the equivalent of going to, like you said, a psychology conference and being able to just sit there and listen to a panel, yes, talk absolutely. about different things. And, you know, when I, when we have that, that room on Wednesday nights from, mm -hmm. you know, we do it from six to eight every Wednesday night. And I think some of the conversations we've had in there have just been just fascinating. You know, people get into mm -hmm. DNA and, and yes. digital forensics and all sorts of uh, cool things. So, and the funny thing, join us there too. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh no! One thing that had happened in that one group that I I had joined you in um, with the DNA experts, it's you had some of that kind of back and forth between experts. That gets really interesting because that is something you only see like at conferences, at professional conferences in the past. So, for the average person to kind of be able to kind of see what that's like, that's a whole other interesting thing. It, it can be its own little drama. But yeah, well, that, that particular, that yeah, that was interesting. Um, uh, Suzanne Ryan and, and a guy named Jarrett, uh, both DNA experts, and mm -hmm. one was kind of on the defense side, and one was kind of on the prosecution side and talking mm -hmm. about the feasibility of DNA, where DNA can actually be pinpointed to. And like, uh, like our, our friend Tom was saying, you know, a couple of titans going at it. And just yes. talking about if I came up to you with this DNA profile, in the courtroom, you know, this is the type of, and just, yeah, mm -hmm. that, that was, 
that was a really interesting conversation. And absolutely, I, I can't think of any other platform where that could have happened outside of no. a conference or outside of an actual courtroom. Yeah, not at the not in the way that it can happen on Clubhouse, right? This real mm -hmm. live on the spot back and forth. Yeah, because absolutely. a few sentences in social media is very different. Yes, right? very much so. Very much so. even even making a video, you know, it's it's mm -hmm. all it's all static. It's mm -hmm. not live going back and forth, um, you know, that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. absolutely interesting. So, hey, I appreciate you coming on. Just great stuff. And I, I hope as you move along in your career that we'll be able to have you on again. Absolutely. would love to be back. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, and yes, um, I do encourage anyone who's interested to follow me on social media. Um, I am on Instagram and Clubhouse. Clubhouse is where I'm most active right now. I am since I am kind of in the process of applying for postdocs and all that. But I do want to start developing more content to educate like on TikTok and things like that, because I, I haven't done any content in those platforms. Um, but one of the things I do want to do is uh, educating students on how to pursue the field and things like that. So that's definitely an area that I want to help students with. But on Clubhouse in our Forensic Psychology Club, we're going to have rooms for students to be able to ask those kind of questions as well. So. Oh, very cool. So find you on Clubhouse. And also, um, I will post your well, I'll post whatever kind of information you want us to post, you know, you like your LinkedIn mm -hmm. profile, and people can connect with you yes. there. Fantastic stuff. Okay. Thanks, Great. Doc. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Talk to you later. Bye.